This conference will now be recorded. All right, thank you very much. My co-author in this project are Katrin Eichen from University of Alaska Fairbanks, Libby Lagerwell, also from EcoVoci, Emily Reisner, who is a member of the Shellfish Assessment Program in Kodiak, and Louise Copeman, who is a member of the Fisheries Ecology Behavioral, Fisheries Behavioral Ecology Program in New York. So, snow crab, Anocetes papilio, in Alaskan waters range from the southern Chukchi Sea up through the northern Bering Sea and Chukchi Sea all the way to the Beaufort Sea. In the southern Bering Sea, the males grow quite large and support, well, historically have supported an important fishery. North of there in the northern Bering Sea and Chukchi Sea, the crab do not get as large. It's generally assumed that the year-round temperatures are too cold north of the Southeast Bering Sea to support, you know, large crab. But they do have, you know, populations. So, as I said, there is an important fishery for these in the Southeast Bering Sea. This figure, can you see the this moving on there? This figure shows the size of frequency in the annual bottom fish, or the annual trawl survey. It's the annual ground fish survey, but it's also obviously for crab, it's multi-species. And of the Bering Sea, but there's one of these every year from 1980 down the bottom, all the way through you know 2021 at the top. What I want to point out is that recruitment to the survey has always been very important to the fishery, to the population dynamics of the species, and eventually to the fishery. As you can see, a small crab recruit to this fishery every once in a while, and then through time they grow. There's one pulse of recruitment there, and one pulse of recruitment there and one there, and they grow to a size where they can support the fishery. And then there's been periods of very poor recruitment. So, we go. so like recruitment has always been very important to this fishery. In 2021, the Eastern Bering Sea snow crab population crashed. Leading up to that had been a period of poor recruitment. And poor recruitment isn't the only problem that snow crab had. There was this pulse of recruitment that recruited to the, the annual survey in 2015. And, you know, there was hopes that that would continue to grow. But that pulse, that year class, seemed to seem to die. It disappeared. And I think the best guess is that it had high mortality during the breeding heat wave. But recruitment has always been important. And now that the stock has crashed, there's no way the stock can rebuild until there's another pulse of recruitment. The recruitment is really important in this survey. And I keep mentioning recruitment to the survey kit. You can see, you know, it's kind of small. This figure doesn't start until 25 millimeters. The crab really don't recruit until this, to the annual trawl survey until they're between 25 and 40 millimeters. And so we know a little about the 25 millimeter crab. This is the annual trawl survey. The mesh, you can see the holes are just too big to retain the small crab. So there's this time period when the crab are less than 25 millimeters that we know very, very little about, you know, control, you know, survey the numbers of the crabs. You might think 25 millimeters, that sounds very small. If that was a cod or a pollock, that would be like a, a late stage juvenile fish in its first year of life. But these crab are actually very slow growing. These two slides are from a study that was done in the Gulf of St. Lawrence you know, in, in Canada, in the Atlantic, and it's the best study I know of that shows these very earliest benthic stages, it shows their growth, and it shows some information about their habitat. So this figure on the left shows all of the size classes that were found in, in this survey area in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. 
Um, these researchers concluded, it was the own and all, 2003. Talk more about that paper in this talk. But these researchers concluded that these fish, not fish, excuse me, that these crab molt multiple times in their first two, you know, when they're age zeros and age ones, they go through multiple molts. And after that, they go into a, a cycle of one molt per year. But I guess what I'm getting at is, according to their conclusions, by the time a crab is 25 millimeters in order to group to our ground fish survey, it's probably already about four years old. And so there's this gap in this life history that our ground fish trawl survey can't tell us much about, and consequently, our center knows very little about. This figure on the right shows the temperature that these crab in the survey occupy. Each one of these dashed, dash, excuse me, dashed or dotted lines is one of these different size categories that are shown here with these lines. And the x-axis is temperature, the temperatures that are less than two degrees C is for emphasis. And you know the, the lines all represent the cumulative fraction of each of the population of these life stages that occupied different temperatures of habitat. And then this this solid line shows the cumulative fraction of all of the survey station temperatures. And so what this figure shows is that they surveyed temperatures from almost negative one to five degrees. But all of the crab in the survey, or nearly 100% of them, occupied temperatures of two degrees C or less. And so the conclusion is that these crab crab stages, these very small stages, are stenothermic that they require, you know, they've got this very narrow temperature band that they can survive in, and they require these temperatures less than two degrees C. This idea that these small crab are endothermic and require small temperatures has been very influential in studies of Alaska snow crab. All of these studies that I've listed, you know, scientists study, can kind of assume that the small stages are stenothermic. And these, and these studies, are for a variety of reasons. Most of them explain, you know, population shifts in abundance and spatial shifts and trying to relate that to climate. Also, there's some laboratory studies that, you know, select temperatures based on this two degree figure and also interpret results. And so we know that temperatures have fluctuated greatly in these crab habitat. Northern Bering Sea, you know, the cold pool fluctuates between being pretty much non-existent in the, in the Bering Sea in some years, all the way almost to the Alaska Peninsula. And so this two-degree habitat varies a lot. And recently there's been some really warm years where there's been very little, less than two-degree habitat. Also, this figure is from the Chukchi Sea, some temperature results, model results from the southern Chukchi Sea, bottom, bottom temperatures in August. You can see over the last 20 years, they've really increased. So these temperatures are increasing. We've got this idea that these early stages are stenothermic and require less than two degree water. So, you know, some obvious questions are, do these juvenile snow crab in early stages only have at cold temperatures? And what happens in warm years? And what other habitat characteristics are correlated with the juvenile landscapes? So the data that I have to present today are from four cruises from the Chukchi Sea. There are four different, um, four different like, survey programs or initiatives that we've pieced together to form one data set. One is the Arctic Ecosystem Integrated Survey from 2012, and the crab sampling was done by the Kodiak Shellfish Lab. One was the Arctic Marine Biodiversity Observation Network cruise in 2015. We'll talk about how the, the sampling of that was different. It was transects that were fine spatial resolution. And then we have two Arctic Integrated Ecosystem Research Program sampling cruises in 2017 and 19. I should say that 2015, the sampling was led by Katrina Hyken. In 2017 and 19, it was led by Libby Lockwell. All of these cruises were approximately the same time of year. They all started maybe in mid-August and ended sometime in September. Although not exactly the same time. 
in this area is just where the surveys are. For all of these surveys, we use the same basic trough, and that's why we have different information on these stages than the, than the annual brownfish assessment survey. You say this is the trough, it's a three meter beam trough. The largest mesh size is seven millimeters, so it's a lot smaller. It seems to retain these small crab well. Uh, there are some different versions of the troughs and different foot ropes and different deployment methodologies, but it was the same basic troll design of the troll bot. And so for each of these cruises, I'll show a distribution and mean CPUE of the crab by some size ranges that I'll talk to you about in a moment. And we made a habitat model from the 2000, we made models for the habitat of all these life stages in 2015 when we had the high density sample. And also we'll talk about the thermal occupancy. The size categories that, I'll, that you, you'll see these in the results that we use were based on these. This figure shows the size frequency of the crab in 2015. There are a couple of small size modes, less than seven millimeters and seven to 10 millimeters, that if it's consistent with the Canadian study, are probably age one crab. And then there's size, larger size modes, 10 to 15 millimeters, 50 to 25 millimeters, 25 to 40, and greater than 40. The greater than 40 millimeters probably represent multiple year classes, but it seems likely that the other ones each represent. All right, so in 2015, Trin had this sampling design that was more transex across some thermal boundaries. And also in 2015, there were a lot of biotic and abiotic variables that were collected. And so we made some general additive models for each of these um, life stages. The response variable is the CPUE of the, of the size class at each station. And the potential predictors were bottom temperature, depth, sediment type, either percent sand, percent mud, or percent gravel. It sums to be 100% for each, for each uh, station. Or um, chlorophyll A in the sediment, and then the CPUE of large. And by, when I say large, I mean 15 millimeters or larger crabs, so they're still small. But the thought was that we know from uh, diet studies and from lab studies that the smallest crabs are susceptible to cannibal, cannibalization by the larger crabs. So, we included that as a, as a potential predictor of the small crab uh, density. We threw so all of the all of the potential predictors in the models and removed terms until we found the best model. So I'll orient you to this slide because this will be a lot of the results that will show you from each of these uh, each of these life stages. Up in the upper right panel, you'll see the, the life stage I'm talking about. In this case, it's less than seven millimeters. It's the smallest length model. We've got maps of the distribution in every year. The catch rates are shown by these black circles, and the bottom temperatures are interpolated bottom temperatures. The scale of all these interpolated bottom temperatures you'll see are the same, where anything that's kind of blue is less than two degrees, and anything green or a warmer palette is warmer than two degrees. You can see in 2012, the highest densities of the smallest size were in the northern part of the survey area in this water that was less than two degrees. In 2015, for our high density, or, you know, our high spatial resolution sampling, you can really see that the that this small stage was present in this water less than two degrees C and largely absent from the warmer waters. In 2017, was a very warm year for summer bottom temperatures. You see that crab were almost absent. And in 2019, they were, they were present at a few stations, but in 2017 and 2019, you know, the mean CPUE over here on the right was two orders of magnitude less than it was in 2012 or 2015. So there were there were very few of these lines of this life stage. This life stage had a model that explained a lot of the variability, so I'll talk about it. And the the strongest predictors of crab CPUE, of, of the smallest crab CPUE, was temperature. You can see that there's a, a steep decline in CPUE after about two degrees C. It's kind of consistent with this idea that Dion and all had this crab quality of stem thermic on less than two degrees. Also, it's kind of interesting and noteworthy that the Crab, the smallest crab were negatively related 
to the CPU to build larger grid. So I won't go into that much more the rest of the talk, but I think it's kind of interesting and noteworthy. Also, the grid were associated with money. The next size range is a seven to 10 millimeter grid. It looks a little bit different. In 2012, there were some in the north in cold water, but the highest densities by far were in the southern part of the survey area grid that was still covered by these cold temperatures. And that's a pattern that you're gonna see over the next few stages. In 2015, there wasn't that much of a pattern, but in 2017 and 19, when it was warmer, the stage was also, you know, two orders of magnitude lower. The CPUE was then in 2012, so they largely decreased, largely in the absence of the survey. At the next size range is 10 to 15 millimeter crab. And again, they were present in 2012 in the southern area of the survey area, and again, in this water that's less than two degrees C. 2015, there weren't very many of this size range. And in 2017 and 2019, this crap was present. And you're, you're going to see this trend in these future size classes where they started being present in the northern part of the survey area where they were absent in, in 2012. The next size range is 15 to 25 millimeters size graph. And they were also present in the south, in the southern part of the survey area in 2012. And then present much more to the north in 2015, 17, and 19 were largely added. Next one is 25 to 40 millimeters. Again, it's kind of the same pattern. They were present in the highest densities in the south in 2012, and they had moved north in 2015-17. Finally, the largest crab caught 40 millimeters plus. Again, these are probably multiple age classes, but unlike the other ones, these crab were present also in high densities in warmer waters in 2012, and that pattern continues in 2015-17 and 19, and again, there was this northward, this northward shift in their distribution between 2012 and This life stage also had a model that explained a fair amount of the variability, the important, the strongest factors of the depth, where they you know, increase with depth and temperature, which was opposite of the other stages. The largest crab were actually more associated with warmer bottom temperatures. So to kind of summarize a little bit about the, the distribution and the spatial distribution, I've got some maps. This map shows the center of distribution of the three smallest stages in 2012. See the smallest ones were in the northern part of the survey area. And all of these life stages were largely absent by 2017 to 2019. The next size classes, 15 to 25 millimeters and 25 to 40 millimeters in 2012 were present in that cold area in the southern part of the survey area. By 2017 and 19, that area had warmed up and the crab had moved, or not moved. The crab had shifted their distribution to the northern part of the survey area. These figures are similar to the ones I showed you from Dion et al. It's the habitat these crab were inhabiting. And for each year, using 2012, 15, 17, and 19, the size ranges of the crab are represented by different colors. You can see it's 2012, almost all of the crab were inhabiting. Uh, water less than two degrees C, similar to what the Canadians found, except for the largest crab, 40 plus millimeters. Some of those crabs, about half of the population, was having water warmer than two degrees C, out uh, to maybe about six degrees C. In 2015, there was this interesting pattern where the smallest size ranges that we think were H1s, these less than seven millimeters and seven to 10 millimeters were found almost entirely in this water, less than two degrees C. And progressively, the larger size classes can have warmer water. And then by 2017 or 2019, again, the smallest size classes were much reduced and largely absent, but the crab were inhabiting much warmer temperatures from you know, two degrees all the way out to, you know, in 2019, like eight degrees. So there's this big shift in the temperature that these crab, uh, you know, 
Right, so what might some of this mean? Well, I mean, we see that the Chukchi Sea juvenile snow crab distribution and site structure has changed concurrently or coincidentally with warming. Warming could mean a lot to the Chukchi Sea ecosystem. These crab are a big part of the benthic biomass. They're predators, they're a prey item. And so, like, what that means to the Chukchi Sea, you know, benthic community and ecosystem is an open question. Also, you know, the smallest crab in the study were only found in cold water. We didn't find large abundances anywhere except for cold water. In the year we had a model, you know, it showed that crab were associated with these cold temperatures. It could be that temperature has a large effect in snow crab at the earliest life stages, and that it's evident by the time they're year one. You know, it could even be earlier in the life stage. By year one, you can see that there's these big effects with temperature. In the northern Bering Sea, you know, we have these huge shifts in the cold pool. This is water less than two degrees C. It could be that this cold temperature is affecting the population and always has, you know, that it would be evident at the age one life stage, except in the Bering Sea, we know very little about that. We, again, we assess the snow crab population every year with the annual bottom trawl survey that only catches large crab. So if there is an effect on these age one crabs, we just have to wait, wait for like, <laughs> like maybe up to four years as the guess, or maybe three more years after the effect might be knowable. And we don't see these like really strong effects with the crab distribution and abundance and temperatures. Instead, what we get from the groundfish survey is that we have you know this kind of four year black box and we don't know what was happening with the climate or what stages might be important. Like for instance, Phyllis says it might be a cool year at each year, and it may be that the crab in the Bering Sea have a big recruitment pulse that could start to rebuild the population, or it may be that they couldn't. But the groundfish trawl survey isn't going to um, have any information all about that, about that at all until like 2026. All right, and then these small stages were inhabiting much warmer water than they were in the previous study in Canada, or than they were in 2012. By 2017 and 19, they're inhabiting much more water. What does that mean? That's a big question and a big temperature shift. And, and Louise Copeland from the Newport lab is leading some field investigations in the Bering Sea and also some laboratory investigations to study what does that mean? What does this big shift in these crabs temperature mean? She's studying both the direct thermal effects and you know, what does a change in temperature mean kind of directly to these crabs vital rates, their growth rate, their metabolism, the amount of clippets they can store. And also, what does it mean indirect, indirectly from, the, from food web effects? We know that the cold water is associated with the sea ice. You know, the cold pool is caused by spring sea ice and there's no cold pools because there was no sea ice. And we know that that causes big changes in the ecosystem, starting with the amount of phytoplankton and the type of phytoplankton, and then it, including the amount and type of food that falls to the floor of the benthic ecosystem. So Louise is studying that with a fatty acid biomarker approach, where she knows the fatty acid signatures, a lot of different organisms, including um, diatoms, which are associated with sea ice. And she's tracking that to the, through the food web to the crab, so she can see different crab in different areas where the food that we're consuming comes from, and she can look at that crab, those crabs' condition. It's a way that she will be able to link, you know, the loss of sea ice to what's happening to these crab populations. All right. Finally, you know, there's this idea that's been, you know, that's that's been discussed by other authors. Aaron Fedewa et al. have a good discussion in their 2020 paper, but that the early juvenile stages could be limiting, they could be the limiting stages for this population in its response to climate change. And mostly in these studies, they're looking at the, the brownfish survey results and trying to, trying to guess what's happening in these first four years of life. I think this study you know, provides some direct evidence that some of these stages, at least stage ones, might require temperatures that are less than. To and so 
whether this population in the Bering Sea could rebuild itself, or whether the population could shift to the northern Bering Sea, or whether the northern Bering Sea might become too warm for snow crab. I mean, even the southern Chukchi Sea might have been too warm for the smallest stages in some years of the study. We, we just don't know. But it seems like species response to climate change is going to be really limited by what these small, how these smallest species react to climate change. And we know the very least about these stages. So obviously I'm a proponent of more study of these early stages. Many people helped with this project. Funding agencies, because there were so many, uh, so many different studies for NOAA, UAF, BOEM, NOPP, and MPRB. And then many people also assisted with preparing crab sampling gear or helping with this presentation of this project. All the scientists and crew members who helped with the data gathering. There's a picture here from every survey, although there's not all the scientists. And then I would answer any questions. Are there any questions in the chat? Not yet. That was a great presentation, Dan. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, have a, I have a question about what, you know, in your dream world, what additional sort of surveys or sources of evidence would you have to kind of be able to target those I mean, in, juvenile stages? In a perfect world, if we had enough money, there would be either part of the ground fish survey or our organization would run an annual survey, you know, throughout the Bering Sea, where these juvenile stages are. And we could, we could, you know, track down the environmental effects and we could provide, you know, knowledge about what might be coming to the ground fish surface. We saw pulse of age ones, we could follow that annually and, you know, give some information about what's coming. So I remember a presentation a hundred years ago or whenever it was, the idea was that most of the spawning for snow crab is in the north and that they make their way southward. Is that still a prevailing thought or did I misremember? No, I think that's still a prevailing thought. That the spawning would, would take place somewhere south of that, of, you know, either the northern part of the southern Bering Sea or the northern Bering Sea. Spawning would, and the currents would, would move the okay. planktonic stages north. And they would settle in the northern Bering Sea or in the northern part of the southeastern Bering Sea, and then they have to walk south. To the okay. Lakes. Okay. Thanks. So the habitat has to have conductivity, you know, between the between the habitat at times. There has to be conductivity for all of these stages, and it's got to be within walking distance. And the adult males are the ones that often walk the furthest or whatever. Yeah, um, I think so. There's one paper, I'm sorry, I can't remember which one even talks about how far the males are walking. They see yeah. them walking the furthest. Yes, um, thank you for the talk. This is more of an observation. So on the age zero juvenile survey in the Bering last year, we were doing bongo toes at night. We, it was warm water, we weren't getting any crabs. And then the second we hit the cold pool, it was full of Kinocetes megalope, which are the much smaller than all these that yeah. you're mentioning here. Well, they're not much smaller than some of these sites. Oh yeah, but they were like, I immediately noticed, and I know how to look for them now. I don't know what species, but I know how to genus them. And it's like, these are all crabs. And it was like, we get into the cold pool, there they were. No, I mean, I think that would be fascinating data. I don't think yeah. all sorts for that. But yeah, but the caveat is, is that the pongo does not say the best. That's always, we yeah, have to say that. So Jared Weems is, we've been given the samples to him, and he's been sorting whole samples for those. Oh, right. right. Yeah, I think, I think that could be some important data. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. Um, I got some questions in the chat. James Overland wants to know about predation by peacock. Well, I mean, we showed that there was this, possible predation by the larger crab and the smaller crab were in this area less than the two degrees C. I think that the two degrees C defines the cold pool and it seems to define a lot of the species distributions for a lot of fish, including cod. And so it's possible that cod could be could be eating these fish. But I think at the size we're talking about, at least the very smallest ones are 
probably some more color. Yes, I mean, I talked a little bit about predation by larger crab, but it could be that these small ones require cold temperatures and has some predation depends from not only crab, but other species. Nice, thank you. Yes, yeah, I have one. This is kind of a follow-up to Phyllis's question here. It's about, you know, temperature and how mo how how mobile you think these these crab are do we think the juveniles have been able to just move to colder areas that you know were not within the study limits or are they just not present and i guess the follow up to that question is you know do you have a lar you know a larger scale picture of you know are were there such cold pools available you know beyond the study area where they could have moved well um you know, especially, but I mean, you can see that sometimes the distributions of these crab were right up to the survey area. Mm -hmm. So your question is really good. Like in 2017, I don't know what was going on east of that. You know, if these crab could, if, you know, if they would have, the crab in the cold pool, the megalope could have settled closer to Russia. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's possible. I don't, I don't have much to say about that. But I will say, I will note that yes, these crabs sometimes were right up against the survey boundary. Mm -hmm. That is possible. Um, piggybacking off of that question, there's another question in the chat from Alex Andrews. Assuming most of the larvae are being transported north through the Bering Strait, what effect do currents have during warm and cold years on the settlement of the seven millimeter stages or less than seven millimeter stages? Well, I mean, that, that could be a big effect. You know, recently, but most I know most about 2017 and 2019, there were high transport years. And so, like some of the differences that you see here, well, that's a short joke here, but you know, like some of the differences, like this life's, uh, what did that say? What life's? He was, he was uh, asking about the settlement of the less than seven millimeter stages. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. There, there are differences in, in the habitat, but in order, you know, to, for these smallest stages to have been happening, they would have had to get pushed way north out of the survey area. I guess it's possible. I don't know. I don't know. Somebody else might know more information about that who's been studying those years with other quarries and transport, but I, off the top of my head, I don't know. Yeah, the transport has varied since 2010, um, and there's a fair record of it between Rebecca Woodgate's uh, data and are the data that we've collected in a couple of places. And Callum already's done some work with it because it influences um, how much nutrients make it north before the blooms occur. When do you think spawning occurs? Honestly, I don't know enough about it to tell you what's going on with my topic stages. Okay. But I know that, I mean, it's even, there's, Crap to me are still pretty strange. I don't think they've got internal fertilization. And I read some paper about how in some years it might take the embryos like multiple years to even develop. Don't quote me on that. Anybody wants to know more about that? Should they get <laughs> but you know, I think so. Like, I guess you would talk about spawning when these things were released, but I don't even know what time. And you know, they could have been alive for some time before that. Hmm. Yeah, so I've always been fascinated by snow crab because from almost every other arthropod species, they get bigger as you go from low latitudes to high latitudes. It's called the temperature size rule. Why are they opposite? I mean, the only thing I can say is the very little I've read about this is that people assume that the temperatures are so cold, and then they or have been at least up the year-round temperatures. The temperatures opposite are the summer temperatures. And, you know, if you look at the Chukchi Sea, even though it's been warming now in August, most of the year it's, you know, it's like... Minus 1.7. Minus 1.7. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, it's so cold that maybe that limits them. I don't know. Maybe, I mean, Louise might know more about that or, or some other people. I, I, I can't tell you exactly why that they would be the one that are reversed. Yeah, it's very interesting. Maybe it's just the ones closest to the, you know, to the actual coldest limits. I, I don't know. Yeah. All right. Thank you all for coming and listening to our talk. Very nice. Thank you.
Anyone wants to go to the water? Water, water, water. 